Well, that's a great note to start out on this morning before we dive into um, the message. We're going to read a little scripture over our time, over Mike. If you don't know me, my name is BJ. Um, I'm a staff pastor here, and I'm going to read from Numbers 11 today. So this morning, Numbers 11, verses 24 through 30. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He brought 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to him. He took some of the spirit who was on Moses and placed the spirit on the 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they never did it again. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. The spirit rested on them, and they were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, assistant to Moses since his youth, responded, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses asked him, Are you jealous on my account? If only all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would place his spirit on them. Then Moses returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. Thanks, BJ. Am I back on? Is it working? Okay. <laughs> testing, testing. Well, let's see if I remember how to teach. Um, it's, been a, it's been a little while. Mark chapter 9, you guys. Let's turn to Mark 9 this morning, and I'm going to explain a little bit as we get into um, a bit of introduction for our text, why I asked BJ to share that passage from Numbers chapter 11 this morning. But if you turn to Mark chapter 9, we're going to pick up in verse 38, where Todd left off last week and finished this chapter together this morning. So I encourage you to grab a Bible in front of you. You can use your device, whatever you have, but let's, let's open the Word of God together. And, and see what he has for us. Author Brittany Allen uh, wrote a few years back, comparison can drive us to sinful competition with other believers. We might find sinful motivations in our heart for serving at church or studying our Bible. If we can do more and do it better than them, we get the praise and recognition we deserve. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I have. I've had the wrong motivation when it comes to um, doing things in the church or even reading my Bible or even approaching ministry, where there's even a heart of competitiveness inside of what I'm doing. And reading this morning's passage this week and the passage that preceded it from last week, this quote lands perfectly in between Mark 9.33 and verse 42. Because the disciples argue about who's the greatest in the kingdom from last week's message. And that carries on into what motivates John to say what he says here at the beginning of our text this morning. And it's about to reveal that they have at least attempted, not only in the midst of their arguments about who's the greatest amongst the disciples, but they've attempted to stop someone from casting demons out of people in Jesus' name. The topics of exclusivity, comparison, and competition are presented to us, all of which Jesus is going to speak to, he's going to correct them, and he's going to instruct us about them. Now, this is what led me to Numbers 11, which I had BJ read for us this morning, because Moses says something so important for us, not only to remember, but to argue, or to agree with in heart and action. This is something we should think about, I think, very carefully this morning, and it's his declaration to Joshua in that text. Where he says, if only all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would place his spirit on them. Do you feel the longing in Moses in the midst of that statement? I don't want to do this alone. I want God's people to be filled with his spirit and to be used by him. Moses longed for people to be filled with the spirit of God and to declare his word. Even Joshua even Joshua, who I greatly admire in Scripture of having this amazing heart and this being this amazing leader, even Joshua says, you've got to shut these people up. 
You got to shut these guys up. They're not where they're supposed to be right now. And the spirit has come upon them and is speaking through them. They're prophesying. Stop them. Stop what God's doing. It's interesting because we don't think about it in that phraseology. But how often have we felt that way when God was using someone else besides us? Or when God was blessing another church and using them in the community, but we're not being used in the same way. Here there comes up this conversation that presents itself a conversation about getting caught up in Joshua's mindset of exclusivity. This should be Moses's job and nobody else's. And only the people that are in front of Moses are the ones who should be able to do this. And yet God, in his grace, pours out his spirit on two homeboys back at camp. That's the paraphrase version. Right? We get this exclusivity when it comes to whom God is using. And we start to think, I think we start to think this way in the church too. This is nothing new to us. Maybe it's something that's not on the forefront of our vision, but it should be because of what we see in our text this morning. And even though because of Jesus and his complete atonement for sin, all believers have been filled with the Holy Spirit and are given spiritual gifts for the glory of God, we can start to get a little bit competitive with other churches. And if you haven't felt that way before, I'm so proud of you. I have. I struggled with this. And yet John the Apostle writes in 1 John 4, 13 through 15, this is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. That's for believers. For believers, he's given us his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. Shouldn't we celebrate it when the Lord is using his church, his people all over the world in ways that he's not using me? Doesn't that show the amazing reach of God's ability? But rather we get competitive. That passage is so important to keep in the forefront because when we interact with each other, we're not simply having a conversation with another believer. Never forget this. You're not just meeting another church goer. We interact, especially amongst the other three churches that we fellowship with. Remember this, you guys. We're interacting with an image bearer of the king and someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Remember that. They are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We ought to treat each other as such. That's why Jesus tells his disciples, you know how the world's going to know? The, not only the existence of God, but the power of God is your love for each other. There's no place for sinful comparison, jealousy, competition. How much disunity has been fed by our churches when we think we're better than others in our community or that we got a trick that nobody else has? Like Transform has the special sauce of Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> Don't whoop! <laughs> this is the anti-whoop. <laughs> How many of our churches seek to delegitimize the work God's doing through other ministries because it's not being done in our ministry? If this isn't happening here, that's amazing. I want us to be very careful that those seeds are not inside of our heart. We need to be very cautious. Jesus speaks to this here. Let's look at this interaction between John the Apostle, who is speaking on behalf of all the apostles, because he'll use the term we. You'll notice in verse 38. But let's get into our text. We're going to read the first section, then we'll read the second section after that. Our first section is verses 38 through 42 of Mark 9. It reads this way. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Jesus said, Don't stop him, because there's no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. This is the words of Jesus. On the heels of our Lord telling them that the first will be last and the last will be first, he taught humility by placing a child in their midst and revealing that the world's philosophy is that you're great if others are working for you. That you're great if others are subservient to you. But Christ's message is that grace and greatness comes with serving others. 
That greatness in the kingdom of God is to serve other people. It's to be the servant of all. It's to be the foot washer, if you will, that he gives them an example of in John chapter 13. And it's at this point here in the story that John speaks up after Jesus teaching this. He brings this little child in the midst of them. You guys studied it last week. If you, if you weren't here, I encourage you, uh, go grab the YouTube video or listen to the message. Todd did an incredible job. And, and, I, and he takes... This child, as he places in front of me, teaches him this amazing lesson. And it's at that point that John feels the need to vindicate the zeal of the apostles, of the twelve. Well, here, here's what you need to understand. We are so zealous for you, Lord. We're so all in for you that anyone who's not in this group, we're stopping them. Check it out. And he tells them, we saw a guy casting out demons and we stopped him. We tried to stop him because he's not with us. How dare he? But Jesus reveals that the man using his name is submitted to his authority. Look at what he says in verse 39. There's no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. Jesus says, don't stop him. In fact, he's for us. He's for us. He's a part of what I'm doing. It's an extension of the work of Jesus that goes beyond what we can see or understand. For whoever is not against us is for us. Jesus reveals something that's very, very important. The impossibility of neutrality. Jesus reveals the impossibility of neutrality. In other words, you cannot say that you're somewhere on the fence with Jesus. You can't say that you're somewhere on the fence when it comes to living for God. You are for him or you're against him. Jesus makes it clear. You're with me or you're not with me. And it's interesting how we'll look at some people and go, I wonder, uh, you know, we try to figure this out, right? Or we even look at other people and say, because you're not doing it here, clearly you're not for God. Because if you were for God, you'd be doing it with me because I'm the only one who has the only trick and tell. Right? You can go back and slow it down and listen to it later. But here, like, do, you guys, do you guys understand that, that the Lord is working in ways beyond us? And this man who was left anonymous was bringing glory to his name. So he had to be for the Savior. He was bringing glory to the name of God. And he says, don't stop him. He's for me. And as you read this, do you wonder why this bothered the disciples so much? That this guy was casting out demons? Is it because they had a secret Dakota ring or club that they were a part of? They're like, he's not wearing the Dakota ring. He can't be a part of our club. Right? He can't do the things that we do. Was it zeal that they were just wanting everything to be done Jesus' way? Or is it because they were butthurt that they couldn't cast a demon out of a kid earlier in the chapter? That happened in Mark 9. They couldn't cast. Well, look, I, I, I actually have a slide for you. Mark 9, 17 through 18 says this. Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Like, that for me, when I read that, I was like, <laughs> just kind of like stopped. I was like, how much of my motivation for having an issue with other believers is because I failed at something? How often do I take issue with other people because I failed at something that they're succeeding at in the Lord? And the jealousy rears its ugly head. You don't think it's in the church? You don't think that envy exists? If I were in their shoes, it would have really bothered me that I couldn't cast that demon out of them. And they come across a guy who's not even part of their company. doing things I failed at. He chose me to be part of this work. I know that he chose me. Not any of the disciples would look and say, well, we're kind of not sure if we should be here or not. We just kind of showed up and started following. It's like, no, Jesus made it clear. You, 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 you. He selected. You're with me. He selected them. Even said when we were reading in Mark chapter 3 that he took them up, a bunch of his disciples there and said he selected the 12 himself chooses me to be a part of this group and yet he's doing things through others that i haven't been able to do now that's not going to give you a complex i don't know but it's a good kind because it makes us face our flesh what is truly motivating me to do the work of god 
Casting out demons is a really powerful demonstration of God's power, of his authority over spiritual forces in the world that he gives to his church. However, did you wonder why Jesus talked about a cup of cold water in verse 41? Look at the text. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. Now, what an odd place, if we're not looking at the whole context, and especially the passage prior, to just mention that giving a drink of water to somebody is something that's reward-worthy in Christ's name. It is not necessary to perform great miracles to prove our love for Christ. You don't have to perform great miracles to show Jesus that you love him, or to reveal that his love exists in you. You can do the very simple things, church. We can do the very simple things. The stuff that you may look at and say, everyone else has all this gifting, but I got nothing. All I do is try and put food on the table for my kids. All I do is go out and work in the yard to try and make the yard somewhat presentable so when people come over from church, they don't make fun of me. I'm just kidding. That's never happened. But you guys... <laughs> Lovingly, what did Jesus teach them in the prior passage? This is why I'm tying all these together. Lovingly receiving a child in his name is reward worthy in the kingdom of God. That's greatness. Giving someone a glass of water. Think of it this way. Giving somebody the necessity, something that they need. Loving someone when no one else is around, there's no credit to be received, your father sees. He sees that, and those are just as valuable. Those actions, those little things you do, moment by moment throughout the day, are just as important as a demoniac being freed from the Spirit. You guys, that's what he's called us to. Do not devalue the daily serving of Christ in your ordinary lives. Because right here, Jesus says, that is reward worthy. That is greatness. I think we get caught up in the worldly paradigm of power and of greatness from their perspective. We can get caught up even in the church of thinking our church isn't significant unless it does these things. What if one person in the last four years of our church's existence came to know Jesus? Wouldn't it be worth all the labor, all the toil, all the sweat? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Praise God he's done more. But that's all gravy, my because if it was for but one soul that a ministry existed for 30 years, then that ministry was worth doing. You guys, we cannot look at the worldly system of success. Jesus didn't. And if you looked at the worldly system for success and looked at his ministry, you would not call it a successful ministry. Because even at one point in the midst of his ministry, Jesus had offended so many people that he turned to the 12 and said, how about you? Are you guys ready to leave too? He was still doing exactly what the Father had sent him to do. Do we see that it's just as meaningful and powerful for us to love God's children and humbly serve them as it is to have authority to cast out demons? Humbly serving is so important in the kingdom of God that Jesus emphasizes the importance of what he's taught, going all the way back to verse 33 by saying this in verse 42. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. That's a very difficult verse. Here's what he means, you guys. The word Jesus uses in this verse for little ones is different than the one he uses for child in the prior verse in verse 36. Here in verse 42, little ones is speaking of all God's children, believers. All who follow him and seek to serve him. Now, rather than causing a believer to fall away, Jesus says it would be better to be drowned than to do that. Is he saying that you should seek out a large stone that only a donkey could push around and jump into a lake with it? That's not what he's saying. Because he's about to give us more examples of the extremes we should go to. The radical action that we are called to, to be rid of sin in our lives. He's saying, take this seriously. The honest truth of what he says, it'd be better to be drowned than to be thrown into a lake with a millstone tied around your neck. The goal is not that we would go looking for that. The point is that we would take sin so seriously that we would choose death before we would willingly cause someone to fall away. 
that we would choose to die for the sake of others' salvation. Now tell me who is going to do that very shortly. Jesus. He's calling us to be like him. He's telling us, be rid of sin, be free of sin, value nothing in your flesh more than others. Value none of your sin more then you value others around you. Then you value believers. It says, love them to the end. Be willing to die before you cause them to fall away. Do we love each other that way? Because if we love each other that way, it makes life very, very practical for us. It makes the work of the gospel very integral into our everyday lives, not just the moment where, our, you know, God willing, he gives us the power to cast a demon out of somebody. But when I'm at home and I'm mistreating somebody and that causes them to stumble in their walk, that I would take that so seriously that I would be regularly assessing my personal life and saying, is there sin that's causing others to stumble and fall? Am I hurting my brothers and sisters' faith? If there is anything that is causing me to do that, I need to be rid of it. It has to go. As Paul will say later, we need to put that to death. Building on this aggressive view of our sin, Jesus continues. This is the second section of our text in verse 43. He says, and if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. Boy, that's a mouthful. There's a lot there. And I don't think that it's redundant that Jesus said hand, foot, and eye. Because if you think about the significance of those, significance of those things, what you do, where you go, and what you see. Boy, that covers a lot of our sinful, sin lives, doesn't it? That covers a lot of the things that causes us to stumble. No, Jesus is not telling you to maim yourself. That's not what he's telling you to do. As a continuation of verse 42, he is using physical metaphors to make a spiritual point. But I, here's something we need to remember, you guys. Please hear this. When the lesson is learned spiritually, it will shape our physical lives. When the lessons of Christ are learned spiritually, they will shape our physical lives. If you want to know if you truly believe what Jesus says, if you want to know if you've actually taken it in and put it into practice, look at how you live. Your physical life will change. It reveals our belief when we take action based on that belief. When the lesson is learned spiritually, it shapes our physical lives. Jesus is demanding the cessation of the sinful activities of these members, our physical bodies. Radical spiritual surgery is demanded for this. Maybe that's why he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And when we are born again, we are now free from the law of sin and death. And we are now slaves to righteousness. Amen? Amen. Courtney, I love you. <laughs> Guys, nothing less is at stake here. Nothing less than life. Eternal life. How seriously are we taking our sin? How seriously do we take it when we recognize that there is sin in our lives? Understanding that sin is a cancer inside of us. And that without drastic measure, it will lead to death. You cannot pretend like it's not there just because you don't have symptoms. If it's there, it's a problem. And sin, so much like cancer, which many of us have watched take its course in people's lives that we love, it is not satisfied to stay in one place, is it? It grows, it spreads. Your little sin that you may think that you've hidden away so well that nobody knows is killing you. It's spreading. Maybe it's not on the surface yet. Maybe you aren't feeling the symptoms yet, but you will. And so Jesus calls our attention to this and says, if anything is causing 
one of these around you to stumble. It would be better if you were thrown into that lake. And that doesn't mean he wants you gone. He says, take drastic measures. You're like, how drastic? Well, if it's a hand, cut it off. If it's a foot, cut it off. If it's an eye, gouge it out. And he's again, not telling you to maim yourself. Be aggressive with your sin. Take drastic measures to stop and get away and have accountability. And he uses this reference in each situation for it would be better, for example, for you to enter life lame than to have two feet, two feet and to be thrown into hell. Now the word that he uses there for hell is Gehenna. It's a Greek form of the Hebrew words Gehenna. It means the Valley of Hinnom. You'd be familiar with this from the Old Testament because it was the southern part of the city of Jerusalem. It was a valley. It was a site of the city which was used in Old Testament times for human sacrifices. When they went idolatrous in the times of the kingdom, human sacrifices to Molech were happening down there in the valley of Hinnom. You read about it in Jeremiah. Well, when King Josiah became king, he put a stop to it. And that place, he did that in 2 Kings 23. In that place, the Valley of Hinnom came to be used as a place where they would throw human excrement, rubbish, animal carcasses, and they would burn them there. They were dumped there and they were burned. And the fire of Gehenna never went out and the worms never died. So it came to be used symbolically of this place of divine punishment. And Jesus ties this understanding of Gehenna from the Old Testament with a quote from Isaiah 66, 24. And if you have a hard time finding Isaiah 66, 24, it's the last verse of Isaiah. The very last verse of the book. And it says this. This is an intense verse. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For their worm will, not, will never die. Their fire will never go out. And they will be a horror to all humanity. That's an intense verse. With biblical warnings of the horrors of hell, of the horrors of separation from God. No wonder Jesus urges this drastic action against sin that will sacrifice sinful pleasures today for the reward of eternal life. He says nothing here is worth doing that is disobedient to God in the perspective and in the light of eternal life to come. Nothing here is worth that. Nothing here is worth trading in the love of God and the family of God to have here in this life and say, well, this mattered more to me. And in the end, I think I got a pretty good deal. Nobody is going to think that at the end. No one. Because separation from God is hell enough for me. Separation from God who created me, whose presence I have known, whose creation I have seen, the spirit that fills me. Thinking of being separated from him is hell enough. And to think that that would be for all eternity. We ought to be a people in light of what God has given us. In light of how much we deserve punishment for sin. He has given us his righteousness in exchange for our filth. We ought to be a people who pray as the psalmist does, as David wrote in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 verses 20 through, or 12 through 14 says this. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Put that on a card and stick it somewhere you see it all the time. And pray that, Lord, what are my unintentional sins? Would you cleanse me from hidden fault? And Lord, keep me from willful sin. Don't let them rule me. Don't let any sin become a master of my life. Wearsby said this as he emphasizes this section of Mark 9, how essential it, it is for sinners to trust Jesus Christ and be delivered from eternal hell and how important it is for believers to get the message out to a lost world. You cannot with conviction preach that which you do not live. I used to say that which you do not know. But you can teach what you know. 
but you reproduce who you are. You can teach people something that you know, but you cannot stop yourself from producing who you actually are. Do you feel the need to deal with your sin even more? Because I do. To know that I could talk all day long about what's right, but if I'm living something in the dark, if I have a sin in my heart that I have unyielded to the Lord, that I'm reproducing in my children, that same sin. That I'm reproducing who I am. Boy, that drives me to Psalm 19. Lord, don't let me do this to people around me where I'm influencing them and I'm teaching them to be hypocrites. Where I don't live what I preach. I don't want to be like the Pharisees. Because they're not Pharisee. <laughs> Sunday school just comes back like a bat to the head. <laughs> Okay, what's all this deal about, what's all this business about Saul? Let's check it out. It says this at the very end of the text. This is important. Be salted with fire, verse 49. Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. Understand that salt speaks of purity and preservation. We as followers of Christ are called to be the salt of the earth. And some of you may remember that when we went through the Sermon on the Mount a while ago now. It's been a while since we did Sermon on the Mount series. But in Matthew 5.13, Jesus called us the salt of the earth. The presence of sin within our lives puts us in danger of losing our flavor and becoming worthless. In other words, the salt is losing its flavor every moment that you allow sin to exist in your heart. Being salted with fire in this sense likely means that we're going to suffer in the name of Christ. That's why he says in verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. And he says that in the following, salt is good. He said there's going to be an aspect of this to our lives as believers. Every true disciple is to be a total sacrifice to God. And as salt always accompanied the temple sacrifices, so fire, i.e. persecution, trial, suffering, is going to accompany the true disciples' sacrifices. Suffering is going to be a part of it. Indeed, we're called to be living sacrifices. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, you probably know these well. Paul writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. What is your true worship? I'm working backwards. What is your true worship? Living sacrifice. Any idea, like, the depth of that? Like, how many rights does a sacrifice have? What is the sacrifice there to do? Not live. If you're wondering. <laughs> it's like, uh, whatever it wants. No, that's the point of the sacrifice. It's being laid out. It's being offered. It's not mine anymore. I, I'm a living sacrifice. I belong to God and be offered up. Use me for what you desire. May my life be a sweet aroma to you. Throw in every possible passage of the Old Testament that shows us the significance of sacrifice. Go to Hebrews and read about how Jesus is our sacrifice. That the Lamb of God came to be slain and that we are to follow in his footsteps and somehow we've gotten that twisted up that we should have everything we want. And we should never suffer. And we shouldn't have to struggle in our lives. And Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You guys, living sacrifices, this is true worship. This is Christ-like don't be conformed, Paul says in Romans 12, 2, to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. And we're like, I want to be transformed by the new renewing of my mind. Get ready to die. You're like, this is horrible. No, eternal life is wonderful. Eternal life is wonderful. But death to self, I think we just kind of brush over it so quickly. We read it in scripture. You're a living sacrifice. Okay. You know, we just go right on by. You're like, stop. <laughs> like, wait a second. Do you understand what that means? 
And some people will look at that and go, I don't want that. In the church. And you're like, that's not Christ then. If that's not what you are submitting yourself to, what are you submitted to? Religiosity? Feel-goodism? Made that one up. Like, what is it that's motivating you? What is it that's driving? What is it that you have given to the Lord? The salt used in Jesus' day contained impurities. It could lose its flavor. And if we lose our Christian character, if we lose the reason why we're here, that we are living sacrifices, that we are to deny ourselves, how will it be restored? What drastic measures against sin need to be taken so that we don't lose our saltiness in this world? Jesus told you, cut it off, cut it off, gouge it out. What is it that he's calling us to? He's calling you to radical obedience. He's calling me to radical obedience. Let me tell you guys this. From a worldly perspective and from our flesh perspective, right now even, in a mindset that we could have in this room, obedience sucks. You're like, this is terrible. I don't want to do this. I understand that. But if we look at it from God's perspective, okay, Notice I gave all those caveats before, flesh, worldly, that's what says obedience is terrible. Actually, I said sucks. But from God's perspective, what is obedience? If you want to know what the greatest picture of obedience is, what am I about to say? Huh? How beautiful is Jesus in the eyes of the Father? How glorious is the obedience of Jesus in the eyes of the Father. How precious is it to him. How worth living is that life that's obedient. I think this all ties together, church, because we so often, I'm speaking, me so often, I look at others and I start comparing. I start feeling like, God should be using me for everything. Why is he using everyone else? I don't realize that sin, that envy, that jealousy, that brokenness is creeping into my heart. I've shifted my focus away from what really matters in his kingdom and I'm making things more important in my personal life for my own benefit than the benefit of the kingdom. And instead of rebuking others, the disciples should have been examining their own hearts. And that's what I want to call us to. How about instead of rebuking others, we just look at our own hearts for a while? That doesn't mean that we don't look at what's going on and say that's not okay. It means that we have to deal with the giant log that's in our own eye first. That's what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, isn't it? He says, deal with the thing that's in your own eye, and then you can help your brother with the speck that's in his eye. Let's start dealing with things in our own hearts. Let's refocus and recenter and examine our hearts the way that the disciples should have been. Does Jesus still love them? Are they still his? Is he going to be faithful to them? All of that applies to you. All of that applies to me. The call to radical obedience is an exciting thing. It means that he wants us to grow closer and have a closer walk with him. Peter, recently in this gospel, known for speaking at the perfect moment and saying the right thing, Uh, it's the opposite, we know that, like so often Peter had foot and mouth syndrome. Through the cleansing, though, and the empowering of Christ, he wrote this in 1 Peter 5, verses 10 through 11, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen? The Peter who struggled so much with the right perspective wrote to the church later in his life after the ascension of Christ and said, the God of all grace is going to restore you, establish you, strengthen, and support you after you've suffered for a little while. He is going himself to finish the work. As Paul would say in Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? I cannot wait for him to finish what he started, and he will. Don't feel condemned this morning, church. Come to Jesus. 
come to Jesus with this sin, with this struggle, with whatever it is, as I'm talking, I recognize the Holy Spirit is working in ways that I don't see. He is working powerfully through the words of Jesus in our lives for things I don't see. There are things that you have thought, oh, the thoughts you've thunk since I started teaching. And he's reminding you, you're thinking of things, and you're like, okay, I want to challenge you. Do not leave that business unfinished. Press into what the Lord has spoken to your heart through his word. Go back and reread it. Make sure that that's what Jesus is talking about. Study the scriptures and deal with that sin internally. Deal with it inside of yourself. Let's allow him to purge sin from our hearts, knowing that he will restore, establish, strengthen, and support us through the suffering that we go through in this life. The goal is that we would strive for greatness in the kingdom of God. And Todd talked about this this last week as he taught. You know, even in church, we're like, you don't really want to look at church people because they'll take it in in the wrong way and be like, you guys need to go be great this week. Right? Because immediately you're like, oh, Mike's seeker sensitive. No, I'm not. I'm not. When I say I want you guys to go alongside me together, that we would do this together and we would go and be great this week, do you know what I mean? That we would humbly serve. Because that's exactly how Jesus did it. That we would find the things that need to be done quietly and do them. That we would serve one another in the ways that are lowly and are unseen. Let's do that together because that is being great in the kingdom of God. We recognize that that's how we emulate his character is when we take the lowly position and say, I love you. What do you need? Can I get you a meal this week? You need that fixed up? I got people in this church that rush to help me with things. I know they probably just think it's just free time to hang out with me, but it blesses me so much when someone comes and cuts a limb off my tree for me. Or when someone comes last minute and fixes my oven, this has all happened like in the last week, like, like little things like, I don't know how to do this. Like, I don't have a chainsaw. <laughs> you guys, those things, those things are special. Love each other in the practical ways. Humble service. Worship team, would you come on up? On the ideas, as we get ready just to sing some praise for a bit, you guys, When you think about the sin that we've allowed to live in our lives, maybe the things that you've thought about while we've been just in this text, I want to pray over you guys that the Lord would equip you and that you would see his equipping available to you to be free of sin. I don't believe that we're going to be free of temptation. I believe that temptation is going to be there. It's a part of our existence on this planet in this time. Of being flesh and blood, we're going to experience temptation, but I do believe that he has given us freedom and victory to honor him with how we face temptation. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, as we just um, thank you for your word and thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us in the ways that you have and Lord, that we can go back and read your scriptures and see in the, the life of the, of the disciples just um, how they're so much like us. Uh, quick to try and vindicate what I'm doing or explain why it matters. And, and Lord, so often you, you just remind them, don't stop other people from serving me. Let them serve me. And you be faithful to what I've given you to do. Lord, I pray that as we look at our hearts and as we just surrender, we just open our hands to you. We just thank you for your love for us, Lord. We thank you that you love us to correct us, to instruct us. Lord, to call us on the things that we need to be called on. But it's never angry. It's never never to beat us down, Lord. You're calling us up to walk with you. You're calling us to purify our lives. And you even promised your strength for the task. So, Lord, I pray that even in this time as we prepare to worship, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed and just focusing on listening to your voice, would you speak to us? Lord, would you speak to our hearts and just reveal maybe something that we've placed too much confidence in? Maybe something, Lord, that we know is blatant rebellion. And Lord, um, would you give us victory over that? Lord, show us Show us your glory. 
We want to love you more than anything else. We want to love you more than we love anything in this world. And Lord, I just pray that we would recognize that we love because you first loved us. And as we just are about to sing, Lord, that we would really um, worship you in remembrance of your love for us. So, Lord, just speak to us in this time. Let's take a few moments, church, with your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Let's just listen. Examine our hearts, and then we'll enter into worship together.